You are listening to WPRK 91.5, the voice of Rollins College, Winter Park, Florida. Welcome to the Crummer Hour on WPRK 91.5, Rollins College. I'm your host, J.B. Adams. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College and Victor Media Group. You can check out Victor Media Group and its growing library of shows and podcasts at victormediagroup.co. Today, our guest is Joshua Snyder, who's a Crummer alumnus and Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development at Power DMS, a tech company that provides compliance solutions. And I'm here with our panel of Crummer students and alumni, Gerard Mitchell, MBA 2018, Gerardo Abril, MBA 2020, Kyle Sawyer, current student in EA MBA 37, Loveland Finley, current student in PMBA 60, and as always, I'm JB Adams, MBA 2011. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, pleasure to be here. Hello. Thank All right. you. In a moment, we're going to listen to the Crummer Connections interview with Joshua Snyder that was broadcast earlier this fall. But before we do that, I would like to ask the panel to share some of their thoughts on what the audience should listen for. So what do you guys think? Kyle, what should the listeners check out in this interview? Yeah, well, I, I think some people feel stuck in determining when to pursue an MBA degree. And Josh decided to get his M MBA during a very uncertain time, uh, uncertain job market. Uh, and I think that can resonate with a lot of current students uh, in today's uncertain COVID world. Cool. Uh, Loveland, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's interesting how Josh has leveraged his experience and relationships at Crummer to find a career that he seems to love, but what, you know, what that was unexpected for him. Gerard, do you have a thought? I, in, in Josh's Crummer interview, Crummer Connections interview, it was, it was amazing to hear him speak about his early time working with his parents. I really enjoyed that. You know, I, I did too, and I thought it, the coolest part was when he talks about uh, them being sculptors and Robot Chicken, which is one of my favorite shows. So in the second half of the show, we're going to have Josh Snyder here with our panel to discuss his career and his role in the tech industry. So please stay tuned for that. But first, let's check out that Crummer Connections interview and let's get started. Welcome to Crummer Connections podcast series. I'm your host, J.B. Adams. In this series, I'm talking with Crummer alumni and inviting them to share their accomplishments, challenges, and best business advice. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Consistently ranked as the number one MBA in the state of Florida, the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to prepare you to become a global, responsible business leader. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. Today's guest is Joshua Snyder. He graduated from Crummer with his MBA in 2010. He currently serves as the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development at Power DMS, a company which provides comprehensive cloud-based compliance and content management solutions to help organizations reduce risk and liability. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thanks, JB. Happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Now, I just want to start by acknowledging and this is what i have heard quote unquote everybody knows josh Snyder <laughs> in the crummer family uh and maybe not everybody knows you but a lot of people should know you because you have a long relationship with the school from the time that you graduated so what are the all the things that people would recognize you for? <laughs> um well i i, I uh, as you mentioned i graduated in 2010 so i was there since 2008 uh, almost immediately, I started uh, working in the Entrepreneurship Center as the assistant director there. Uh, I did that for about five years. And then uh, I've stayed involved with the school and tried to, you know, be a guest server at Oktoberfest and, and do whatever I can to stay close to the school, uh, which has a very special place in my heart because of all the time I've spent there. And, uh, and recently, I uh, joined the alumni board this year. Uh, so I'm also on the alumni board for Crummer. I do have to ask you this. Mm -hmm. Is is it okay for us to show photos of you from Oktoberfest? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably, that's probably a fine thing to do. And to say the least, uh, you made an impression at, at Oktoberfest. And uh, uh, I think, I think, uh, I think some folks 
would remember my performances. They may not remember my face, but uh, these pictures might uh, might jog their memory a bit. Yeah, yeah of course. And and uh, I mean, I'm certain that you and I will do Oktoberfest again in the future. Absolutely. I happen to love it. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about Power DMS. First of all, I want to know where the name came from. What does it mean? <laughs> there, there, there's some folklore around that. I mean, Power DMS is a 20-year-old company now, very, very entrepreneurial in its beginning. Uh, the early days, it was called Innovative Data Solutions. Uh, and the concept was that it would be a company that produced many different types of applications. Uh, but the one that, uh, that is our flagship product is the one that really took off and, and the, the brand of that product eventually became the name of the company. And for a long time, uh, DMS was sort of one of those things like good song lyrics where it was whatever you want it to be, uh, whatever it means to you. Uh, but today, uh, Power DMS means document management simplified. Uh, ah. We've sort of codified that into the canon of our company. And uh, that's, what, that's what we do at, at our core. And, uh, and so that's what DMS stands for. Well, I knew there was an answer to that question. Uh, and so everybody heard my introduction about what Power DMS does, but I'd like to have you break it down into layman's terms. for us. Yeah, and our mission is to help our customers increase trust and efficiency by simplifying how they manage and share crucial information. And I understand that that sounds broad. Uh, we work with the public safety fields of law enforcement and fire and emergency management services and we work with healthcare, with hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers and behavioral health facilities and a variety of other high risk, high liability industries in the commercial sector. Uh, and so, you know, what, what organizations want to have in place in order to make sure that they're guiding their employees' behavior in a way that leads to good outcomes mm -hmm. is a system that both allows them to manage all the policies of the organization, review them, have very tight version control draw people's attention to items when they change, collect attestations from their employees, and make sure that their employees have access to these documents whenever and wherever they are. Uh, I wanna talk more about your role, VP of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development. First of all, give us a little explanation of what you do in that role, and then tell us what you love about it. Sure, it's, the title's way too long. I know it's a mouthful, but uh, it, there's a lot in there. and. Um, but uh, I'm business development more in the, in the classic sense, I would say, um, where I focus primarily on different channels and partnership vehicles that help us grow our company. Uh, Power DMS is a content management system that produces not a single piece of content on our own. And so a lot of folks have a set of needs when they come to us as a prospect uh, that include content. They need, they need consultants to come in and advise them on their policies. They want some sample or model policies to start building from as they're redoing their policy manual. Um, all the different accreditation partnerships that we have, we put those standards manuals into our product and allow people to consume them in our product and map them to their policies. And all of those are relationships that me and uh, my team manage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we currently probably have about 70 different active partnerships. Um, based on a number of factors, I think that'll grow to close to 100 over uh, the next several months. Um, and as we, as the team grows, hopefully to manage those uh, because of a lot of things that are going on right now, both in healthcare and public safety. Tell us what you love about it. Uh, you know what I love the most is that it's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not a role um, where every day is the same. I'm working on projects all the time related to every facet of our business, whether it be pricing or new product offerings, um, new go-to-market strategies. So that's a really fun and dynamic environment. And I'm, I'm really, really happy to be uh, part of the leadership team and able to interact with all those folks uh, on those different things. I, I would not do well if I had a job uh, that was the same day in and day out, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. When we come back in a moment, we're going to hear more about Josh Snyder's backstory and how he became who he is. Stay with us. We are back with Josh Snyder of Power DMS, and we're going to learn a little bit more about how he came to be who he is as a business person. 
by delving into his backstory. So Josh, first, some fast facts. Let's uh, find out where were you born? I was actually born in Winter Park Hospital, right down the road from Rollins. Okay, and where were you raised? Uh, but they brought me home to Sanford, and I've lived in Sanford pretty much my whole life with the exception of a couple of years when I was away at college. Okay, so Sanford is your hometown. I want to find out what your early business influences were. Did you have some role models growing up who introduced um, you to this? Yeah, in a roundabout sort of way. I, I certainly had a, a lot of role models, but uh, the first and the earliest ones are my parents. My My parents themselves are would not classify themselves this way, but they're entrepreneurs. They, they uh, own an art studio. They met in art school at Ringling over in Sarasota and they're sculptors. Uh, they do a lot of work in the commercial industry uh, of art uh, for movie studios uh, some stuff at the theme parks. Um, they did uh, a lot of things that are still on display at the Magic Kingdom and MGM Studios, now Hollywood Studios. Are they still in business? They are, absolutely, yeah. They're still grind, grinding away and uh, they also work on a show called Robot Chicken on Cartoon Network. They do a lot of celebrity head sculpts for that. Um, and uh, that show is still going strong after 10 seasons. And I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll keep making more episodes because it's a, a very well-liked property. Since day one, uh, that's a, that's, that was a fun project for them. But, um, you know, I, th they're not business people, though. Uh, and so when I started my undergrad, I thought I wanted to go to med school, but uh, in a... <laughs> through a series of events, I decided to, to, that that wasn't for me and I wanted to go into business. And immediately when I started taking classes, I learned that uh, there were some things that I could apply that I was learning in my undergraduate finance and accounting and marketing classes that I could start uh, experimenting with in their business if they would give a young you know, 20 year old kid the opportunity. Uh, and fortunately for me, they did. And um, uh, I was able to put some some business principles to work to help them grow and professionalize their business. Uh, but they were still role models for me in business because of um, one real simple thing. And that's, they're two of the hardest working people I've ever met. And as a result, they've got lifelong clients because regardless of whether they underquoted a job or whether, uh, you know, uh, they were having to stay up all night to get something done, they just got it done. Every time, uh, you know, they're, they're in their late 50s, early 60s now, and, and they still have that same level of work ethic, um, and they'll grind it out until it's done. And uh, just the ability to kind of dig in your heels and get work done is something that uh, I, I very much value um, in people I work with, and, and I try to aspire to myself. So if I hear you right, working with your parents was really one of your first jobs as a professional, right? Yeah, absolutely. What were some of the early lessons that you had sort of representing the company that your parents owned? <laughs> well, uh, I came into my parents' organization at a time when they were, they were, they had, they had under quoted quite a few jobs and were quite backed up with work and did not really have time to get out there and uh, prospect for new clients, possibly higher paying clients or, um, clients for, you know, that would give them steadier streams of, of, of work. And uh, so reluctantly, my father let me go uh, up to, I paid my own way, but I went up to New York City, I drove, uh, and I went to a, a trade show called Toy Fair that gets held there every year. It's a, it's a, a show that, you know, basically people that make uh, toys, figurines, collectible items are presenting it to potential retailers. And uh, all of these toy makers that could potentially hire my parents to make collectible items uh, for them to prototype collectible items were there. And I, uh, I thought, you know, based on my uh, boyish charm and uh, my, my positive attitude, I was going to be able to go and walk up to those folks and know exactly what to say to earn their business. And uh, it was a, it was a lot of trial and error. <laughs> I, uh, I had a lot of, I learned to overcome objections uh, by doing that after 10 or 12 of those uh, booth stops. And, um, and I, I ended up leaving there with uh, our, our company's highest grossing client um, still to this day uh, in terms of what they were hiring us for and the level of work. And um, that, was, that was a very rewarding outcome. Uh, but it, it, it also, I also ended up with a lot of egg on my face. Aside from the fact that boyish charm is not enough to close a sale, <laughs> what would you say is the takeaway from this 
lesson? Um, I think, uh, I think if you're going to embark on a new task professionally, uh, you should find somebody who's been there and done that and you should solicit feedback. And I don't care if you are, you know, somebody who's been an executive for 30 years, um, coming into a situation, uh, assuming that you've got all the skills and traits from past experiences to make those work in a new environment is probably not a, a formula for success. And even if it is, I, I promise you the people observing you uh, on either side of uh, you know, the deal table, either it, whether it's organizations you're working with or, or folks that you're working with in your own organization are, are going to identify clear gaps that you could have overcome if you had solicited feedback before you went into that endeavor. So I wish I had gotten a little bit more uh, coaching on professional selling. I wish I had talked to some folks that were friendly to our, our, my, my uh, parents' company in the industry to solicit their feedback before I went into that exercise. Um, and I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have you know, run into the challenges that I faced when I was there. Yeah, yeah. excellent lessons. Uh, when we come back in a moment, we are going to hear more about Josh's Crummer experience. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Guy Fagan, an Early Advantage MBA student at the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. My time during undergrad at Rollins College was incredible. I took every opportunity to get involved on campus. I joined the Tau Cap Absalom fraternity, and I was also a member of the Varsity men's tennis team. Crummer has an amazing reputation in the area, so it was a no-brainer. For more information on the Crummer Early Advantage MBA program, visit crummer.rollins.edu. We are back with Josh Snyder of Power DMS, and it's time to find out about how he found his way to the Crummer Graduate School of Business. So Josh, what was going on at the time that it, you made this decision? Um, well, I got my undergrad in 2008. And um, I, I did not uh, intend to set off and get my MBA right away, but it was 2008 and uh, we were right in the middle of the Great Recession and uh, work for a newly minted undergraduate business administration major was not easy to come by. And none of the jobs that were available, I thought would either be fulfilling or set me up for the kind of success I wanted to have or the, the path I wanted to go in my career. So I, I kind of did it on my own and I, I, I sort of lucked into a good decision, uh, which was to go get my MBA. Um, I, I thought that I needed to get, um, you know, I thought that th that period of time would be a great opportunity to continue to refine my business skills, uh, to continue to learn and build on not only what I had taken from my undergrad, but also my, my professional experience to date um, and, and find a way to set myself apart. There was, no telling when things were going to get better in the job market, but I knew with, with an MBA, I was going to have, um, you know, a lot more uh, opportunities, um, even if there were only a handful out there. All right. Well, we each find our way to Rollins uh, in a unique path. Uh, it's <laughs> time now, Josh Snyder. We're going to play Crummer Insider Free Association. Uh, I'm going to read you a list of prompts, and I'm going to invite you to say the first thing that comes to mind. These will all be easy, mostly. And uh, are you ready to play? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Okay, I, I know you know the answer to the, to the first one because you already told us this. I started my Crummer education in the year? 2008. And I finished classes and graduated in the year? 2010, right on time. Uh, the state of the economy while I was a student was? Poor, <laughs> not, not good. Uh, I hope fortunately there was some, you started to see some light at the end of the tunnel and an upward trajectory, but generally it was bleak. Okay, my cohort name and number was? EA13. There were this many students in my cohort. 82, I believe. Oh, wow, a big one. Uh, my cohort <laughs> was known for being? Uh, big, <laughs> just as you said. It, I, I believe it still might be the largest cohort ever. Um, it, it was really difficult even just to kind of get to know everybody and uh, get on a first name basis with everyone in the two years. It was very, very big. Yeah. For our international study, we went to? Uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. My favorite course was? 
Technology entrepreneurship or okay. technology management was what it was called. All right. So I want to follow up on your favorite course. This was a surprise to you, right? Technology was, was really, is always, you know, over the past, you know, 125 years has really changed the world in a lot of profound ways. But um, technology and software was really starting to, you know, um, change the world at that time. Certainly social media and people were just like profoundly, you know, confused and interested in the success of platforms like Facebook. And, and I remember Professor Kupitz in that class taught, making us create a Twitter account. And I still have it, the same Twitter account. And it's Joshua underscore Snyder. Like, good luck getting your first and last name on any social media platform. But that's how, you know, new Twitter was at the time. And my name's not super uncommon. So, um, and I, I didn't, I knew that I, technology was interesting, but in no way did I think that I was going to go become a technologist and work in technology as a career. But the things I learned in that course really sort of like made, gave me a broader sense about uh, the world of technology, the business of technology, and, um, and, and laid the foundation for what would eventually become my career. And uh, I'm certainly open to different opportunities, but I, I foresee uh, myself working um, specifically in, in business to business software for the duration of my career. Excellent. Great takeaways. Uh, when, we, when we come back for our next segment, we will hear about what happened next after Josh graduated. Back in a moment. We are back with Josh Snyder of Power DMS, and uh, we'd like to learn more about what happened after his Crummer experience and his early career post Crummer. So uh, it's graduation, it's 2010, and you've got a plan. Or, I don't know, do you have a plan? <laughs> uh, I, I, I was form, forming a plan. Uh, so... Um, it was seriously still the Great Recession. In yeah, I was going to say, like, 2010 didn't feel that different in terms of 2008. We were probably, like, at the same place, but just kind of, like, coming up out of the valley, if you will. Um, I remember I filled out a lot of job applications. And I will say with my MBA, I felt qualified and was qualified based on, um, based on the requirements for a lot of things that I wouldn't have been otherwise. However, with that being said, um, it was very difficult to get a call back with so many uh, job seekers on the market. Mm -hmm. um, and so I spent a few months looking for different opportunities. I was still working with my parents. I did that all through my MBA program. I was a grad assistant in the Entrepreneurship Center uh, during my time at Crummer. And uh, I ran into Carrie Coates, and, who was the uh, executive director at the time and who I had worked for there and let her know about my sort of beating my head against the wall to try to find my, my thing. And she said, you know, why don't you come over, uh, work over here for, you know, four to six months. I'll get you networked locally, introduce you to some folks, and we'll help find your, your, your thing. And I said, this is like an amazing opportunity that I can't possibly turn down. So I went over with the plan of staying for six months I ended up staying on for five years. And the reason is, is because that experience was great. I loved the job. I loved doing what I was doing. I loved working with students, which I still uh, try to do as often as I can through mentoring, guest lecturing, or whatever the opportunity uh, arises uh, for that to happen. Um, but uh, I also was continuing to get great exposure locally. I, I'm an Orlando guy, Central Florida guy, um, and I, I, I'm going to be here for the long haul. And so getting networked in the community, um, Carrie was a great networker and had a phenomenal network. Um, and she had held a lot of prominent roles in the community before she came to um, Rollins, both with the Orlando Magic and CNL. So just getting to meet the people that she was connected to was, was wonderful. Very good. Uh, so five years at the Entrepreneurship Center and at some point in time, you were starting to see signals that there was an opportunity that was next for you. How did you find your way to Power DMS? 
Yeah, I um, we had we had four pretty distinct programs we ran out of out of the entrepreneurship center for growth stage companies, but occasionally um, someone would come to us with a need that our programs did not solve. Um, or I would just meet somebody in the community that had an interesting, you know, issue that they needed some help with, and I would do a little consulting work with them. Uh, and Power DMS was one of those companies, and it's the first company that I consulted with where I really approached them and said, hey, I, I think I can help you guys with some stuff as I started to learn more about their business. The reason I proactively pursued them is the seeds that were laid in that technology management class for having an, uh, you know, an affinity and a a desire to explore technology companies from looking at all these other different businesses to the work I did in the entrepreneurship center. I really realized I want to work for a technology company software, particularly subscription based software as a service can solve so many business problems. So quickly you can build these solutions and scale them up quickly uh, with the right uh, technology people and capital. Uh, and then they can be implemented so quickly in organizations to rapidly shift uh, the way that business is done uh, or a problem is solved in those, in those organizations. And so uh, that, that whole dynamic was just extremely fascinating to me. And so, um, you know, that consulting gig at Power DMS uh, lasted about six months. Mm -hmm. And I did another six month consulting uh, stint with them looking at new industries and strategies there. And then I got brought on as the director of business development in October of 2016 and uh, completed my five years at Rollins and transitioned right to Power DMS. Time to bring this conversation to a close. So I just wanna ask, Josh, people have listened to your story. They're gonna take an interest in what you have to say. What is the best way for them to reach you if they have questions or, or just wanna find out more? I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email address is joshua.snyder at powerdms.com. Um, and I, and I still take advantage of my lifelong Rollins email address. So you can get me at jsnyder at rollins.edu as well. Perfect. Uh, to sort of summarize all of this with Crummer as uh, the centerpiece, how would you say your Crummer experience changed you? When you go to get your MBA, you're, you're, you're learning how to be a leader. Um, when you come out of that program, I think, um, all the marketing, the management, the leadership, uh, you know, the, the, the accounting, all that sort of, you know, kind of jumbles together in your brain because it came at you so hard and fast. But what it does is it embodies you with a set of skills that sets you up to be a leader, a functional leader in an area of a business or the leader of a company. Um, and so that you're ready uh, with a complete understanding of how all those things work together to make good decisions. And so that's what I feel like coming out of Crummer, I was ready to be a leader. I was ready to step into any business and provide value uh, through the, the principles and the, the, the you know, various sets of things that I learned through my MBA. Mm -hmm. And so if there's someone who's listening to this conversation right now, and maybe they're a prospective student and they're on the fence, should I get my MBA? Should I go to Crummer? What would your advice to them be? I would ask yourself, do you, why are you doing it? And if the answer is because you want to be a leader, then you're making the right decision. Uh, getting an MBA and putting that on your resume is making a statement to the world and everyone else that's ever going to look at your resume or look at your LinkedIn profile that you're a leader. Uh, and I think that's the best reason to go get your MBA is because you want to be a leader. You want to be a leader in your field. Uh, you want to be a leader in your industry. You want to be a leader in your company. And uh, if, if you want to be a leader and you're thinking about getting your MBA, you should do it. This is JB Adams. Please stay tuned for the second half of the Crummer Hour. When we come back, we'll meet with Joshua Snyder to get his responses to questions submitted by you, our listeners, and Crummer students and alumni. You are listening to WPRK 91.5, the voice of Rollins College, Winter Park, Florida. Hi, I'm Sarah Neely. I am an Early Advantage MBA student here at the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Crummer has enabled me with hands-on real-world experience that has been translated inside and outside the classroom. I'm very excited for not only the rest of my second year here at Crummer, but also in the future and to come back and visit. For more information on the Crummer Early Advantage MBA program, visit crummer.rollins.edu.
Welcome back to the Crummer Hour on WPRK 91.5 Rollins College. I'm your host, J.B. Adams. On this program, we feature insightful conversations with faculty, alumni, and students of the Crummer Graduate School of Business as we share ideas and advice in the areas of business, technology, leadership, and professional development. Today's show is brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College and Victor Media Group. You can check out Victor Media Group and its growing library of shows and podcasts at victormediagroup.co. In today's Crummer Hour, we are talking with Joshua Snyder. He's a Crummer alumnus who graduated with his MBA in 2010, and he's currently serving as the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development at Power DMS, a company which provides comprehensive cloud-based compliance and content management solutions to help organizations reduce risk and liability. In the first half of the show, we heard Mr. Snyder describe his upbringing, his Crummer experience, and some of his early career lessons. And now in the second half of the show, we're going to have him here live with us in the studio to have him respond to the questions that were provided by Crummer students, faculty, and alumni. Joshua Snyder, welcome to the show. Hey, JB, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me back. It is a pleasure to have you back. And also with us, we have our panel of Crummer alumni and students, which includes Kyle Sawyer, current student in EA MBA 37. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Lovelyn Findlay, current student in PMBA 60. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Gerardo Abril, MBA class of 2020. Hi guys, pleasure to be here. Gerard Mitchell, MBA class of 2018. Hi guys, great to be here. And as always, I'm JB Adams, MBA class of 2011. All right, Joshua Snyder, welcome again. And our first questions are about your company and industry. And the first question comes from Kyle. Hey Josh, uh, so I love to ask my parents this question and just people who are older than me in general because we've had a lot of uh, you know, technological advancements throughout history. Uh, and I'm curious what you think is the biggest technological advancement uh, in your lifetime. Is it the Facebook, the iPhone? Um, well, Kyle, first of all, I'm, I'm curious to know how old you think I am, because I, I still view myself as quite a young young guy myself. But uh, I, I won't uh, I, I won't I won't do uh, any disservice to the question by belaboring that too much. But um, yeah, I thought about this, and I, I've been asked this question a few times. Um, obviously, you know, the cell phone has sort of changed the way that everybody, um, you know, conducts not only business but their personal life, and and uh, there's a lot of pros and cons to that. Um, I, I'll give you a little bit more of a nuanced answer, though, just from my kind of vantage point. Uh, I think it's interesting the way that software has overtaken hardware. I was in a class in 2008 or 2009, and the current president of Rollins College at the time was in there giving us a guest lecture. And he was saying how basically like the programs that we use in our, our accounts and access to those accounts are, are, are what we're, what's going to be like really the, the, the uh, currency of technology in the future, and that hardware is just going to sort of become ubiquitous. And through cell phones and a number of other factors, that's really played out. You can buy a pretty powerful laptop now for like 300 bucks. Uh, you know, I remember the one I was issued when I was at Crummer was like $3,000. Um, and now it's all about software as a service and things that you can consume and you can consume them from pretty much any single device. And so I think the interesting point is software sort of overtaking hardware has allowed us to spring up all of these incredibly powerful utilities and you know, I might have 40 tabs open on Google Chrome, all with different pieces of technology that allow allowing me to manage my, you know, stock account and Robinhood and my social media accounts, my email accounts, uh, my collaboration tools like Trello and things of that nature. So I, I think that's a really interesting development. And what we're just gonna see is faster and faster development of more of more utilities to help people be productive in their work and personal life. Seems like it never ends. Thank you. And I don't think you look a day over 29. You look like a Oh, person. thank you. I appreciate it. I'm not that many days over 29. At least, at least in my head, I'm not. So, very, very good. All right. Our next question is from Gerardo. 
I noticed that in undergrad, you focused on management and entrepreneurship before getting your MBA. And I was wondering, for people that don't have a big focus on technology during their studies, is there any advice that you could give them to enter the technology industry? Yeah, um, you know, I didn't have a particularly strong focus on technology when I was getting uh, my undergrad and even, even my MBA degree. Um, I would say the same thing that I tell people who, you know, either I'm mentoring in a formal or informal way or just having a conversation with about their careers. If, if you're interested in technology, for example, and working at a technology company, find people that work at technology companies, learn about what they do and pick their brain about what it's like to work there, how they got to where they are, and what sort of career paths they would envision for you given where you're at in your career and your education and how you might be able to crack that industry. If that's something that's interesting to you, I think that's really the only way to do it in an intentional way. Uh, you'll talk to a lot of very successful people who sort of kind of lucked into their, their gig I, I'm, I'm kind of a hybrid maybe of that, but I would tell you if I were being intentional about it, I would find people that work in technology companies, pick their brain for how you, they think you can fit in and how they got to where they are. Uh, I have a follow-up question for that. Uh, Joshua Snyder, are you saying that that was, was something intuitive for you or you figured it out the hard way? Um, I, I would say that I, <laughs> I did end up sitting down with the founder of Power DMS, for example, and telling him that I thought he had a really interesting company. I'd like to know what it looks like to work there. I spent several years sort of pining and looking for the right fit for me. And I wasn't intentional enough about asking people about various careers and the industries that I thought were interesting and how to get to them. Uh, again, I, I would say I, I kind of uh, stumbled into the correct way of identifying a good opportunity. Um, but as I'm mentoring and coaching folks now on their career, I definitely tell them, look, let's get you paired up with some people who really understand the industry and can look at you and your background and tell you how you can get to where they are if that's something that's appealing to you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Loveland. Hi, Josh. Thanks again. What are the biggest technology challenges um, that your industry are currently facing right now? Um, well, at this very moment, I would say that the technology challenges that my, the industries that we serve are facing, um, whether you're talking about technology companies or our customers, uh, it's all pretty much the same. We're, we're learning to adapt to an environment that the current pandemic has created that is not, it's uncertain how close to the status quo prior to the pandemic we're going to get to. And so there's an ever shifting mindset about how we're doing business today versus how we'll be doing business a year from now versus how we'll be doing business going forward indefinitely. Um, and I would tell you that, um, you know, figuring out, we've already figured out and rationalized, I'll tell you as our company, how to work collaboratively and effectively uh, in a pandemic context where we can't be physically together using collaboration tools like the ones that we're using to conduct this, this uh, interview, right? Um, but uh, going forward, as we add new employees to our company, how do we assimilate them into our company culture and get them up to speed on who we are and what we do and how we work in a quick way? And that leads to maybe the second and not possibly the greatest problem, which is um, attracting and retaining talent. Now that's been a real problem for the tech industry, regardless of where you go. Even if you're in Silicon Valley, it's just, you know, the cost of talent becomes more and more expensive as people find opportunities making more money and leaving for other jobs. And that, that really is anywhere in the country. But now we could have an engineer who's doing great work for us. He gets contacted by a recruiter, offered a job coding in the same languages, working on the same type of stuff, making, you know, 30% more than they're making today. They put in their two weeks notice. They end on a Friday working at our company. And then Monday morning, they get up, they put their sweatpants on, they sit down at the same computer doing very similar work, making 30% more money. And so many of the cultural elements of our company that made us such a special place to work at are very difficult to maintain and persevere over time such that we can retain the top talent that we recruit um, without simply just constantly paying them more and more higher uh, salaries. 
So that's a really that's a really challenging dynamic for any company that has a winning culture, a culture that attracts top talent and that people want to work at. How do you maintain that in the context of a, of a remote workforce in a remote work environment? Um, Thank you. Yeah, wonderfully uh, surprising answer. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to these questions, which are about your Crummer experience. And I always like to think of these as good advice for Crummer students. The first question is from me, and it goes back to something that you and I talked about before, which is, um, you remember what it feels like to be a Crummer student. What do you think was your most important time management lesson while you were getting your MBA? Uh, wow. Um, my most important time management lesson. I, I always thought people that, <laughs> I will tell you, I, it, it's, it feels like a lifetime ago, uh, not, to, uh, not to tip Kyle off into how old I really am, but it does feel so long ago professionally. I remember, you know, I don't think I had ever made a list of to-do items before I showed up at Crummer, right? But there was really no way to even possibly remember all the different assignments, activities, and, and uh, obligations you had signed yourself up for without that type of uh, professionalization of your own, uh, you know, uh, schoolwork and, and, and professional work and marrying all those things together. Uh, I would say that, you know, um, this may not be advice that most people would uh, agree with, but um, as you put more and more on your plate, uh, you know, I think, from a time management perspective, what I, I ended up learning by the time I left Crummer uh, was pile as much as you can on there until you figure out what your limits are. Um, but, but know that you have limits. Know that you have limits. That's where I think that, that maybe this comes back to some more rational advice. Know that there are limits out there and you need to figure out what your limits are. Uh, but you know, lean in, take, take on new responsibilities, uh, you know, sign up for the big, you know, uh, hairy, messy piece of the project that no one wants to take on, because that's probably where you're going to learn the most when you're when you're working on something with your teams. Sign up for the consulting project, sign up for the internships, pile it on, and, but know that you're working to identify what your limits are, because once you start to understand your limits, then you start to learn another important lesson, which is how to politely say no thank you when you've had enough. Um, and that is something that I'm still, uh, figuring out today, but I find myself saying, you know, no, thank you. I, I, I just can't do any more, more and more often. And I think that is maybe the, the, uh, like the, that's when you really hit the pinnacle of your time management skills, uh, is when you know to do that. Thank you. Uh, Kyle has a question about your Crumber experience. Josh, I'll be signing up for classes next year. Uh, which courses do you recommend? And uh, do you have any courses that you wish that you had taken during your time at Crummer? Well, as a, as a technologist, I know there is a design thinking course at Crummer now, which was not offered when I was there. So I really do wish I had had an opportunity to take that. If you're interested in product design or product management, anything around technology, I would highly recommend that. Um, and so I, I would recommend signing up for design thinking. Um, that would be the course that I wish I had taken and, and wish I was offered when I was there. Uh, but, you know, I would tell you that um, the best thing you can do if you're thinking about those electives, and those electives are really interesting because those electives can, in fact, lead you uh, on a path to either vetting out whether what you think you want to do for your career long term uh, is the right thing for you or helping you, you know, get a little bit closer to discerning that by getting you some exposure to different, uh, different industries and job functions. And I would ask the people that have taken those courses most recently, the people that are in them now, the people who have recently graduated, uh, there's lots of ways you can do that. I believe, uh, you know, you can, you can try to sync up with some recently graduated alumni, and I'm sure the alumni office would help you with that. Um, you can work through I'm sure the Career Resource Center or Student Services to connect with some active students who are taking classes and concentrations that you are interested in, who can tell you a little bit about their experiences, both with the professors and the courses and the subject matter that they're taking. Uh, and that'll help you figure out, I think, uh, what is the best use of your time when, when your time becomes your own from a course perspective. 
That's great. I actually just had design thinking today. It's uh, some fascinating, fascinating stuff. You are listening to the Crummer Hour on WPRK 91.5 Rollins College. Our guest is Crummer alumnus Joshua Snyder, and we'll continue our conversation with him in just a moment. Please stay with us. Hi, my name is Brandon Anderson, an Early Advantage MBA student here at the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. My time during undergraduate was a complete immersive experience. When I was searching for the next opportunity after graduation, an MBA at Crummer was the best option for me. Crummer has helped me to gain the aptitude and grow as a leader, which have both been essential in reaching my potential. For more information on the Crummer Early Advantage MBA program, visit crummer.rollins.edu. Welcome back to the Crummer Hour. I'm your host, JB Adams. Our guest is Crummer alumnus Joshua Snyder, and with us we have our panel of Crummer students and alumni with more questions about Mr. Snyder's career. All right, our next set of questions have to do with your experience at Crummer, not as a student, but as working in the Entrepreneurship Center and your philosophy of entrepreneurship. The first question is from Loveland. So Josh, um, what skill have you taken from your time at the Crummer Entrepreneurship Center and used in your current role? Um, wow, I, I think there's a lot of them, Loveland. I think, you know, honestly, uh, I came from working in administration in the college at the highest level. That's what someone would see on my resume to running a business development team at a B2B software as a service company. So that most people would say like, how is that in any way, uh, how are those related uh, job functions? But the reality is, is that when we had, we worked at the entrepreneurship center, we partnered with about 40 different, you know, groups and economic development organizations and support organizations for um, entrepreneurs to amplify the work that we were doing uh, for growth stage companies in Central Florida and for the work that we were doing to support our students. And those partnerships gave us access to all sorts of resources and valuable relationships that we were not going to be able to get just plugging away with a staff of three people. Um, and so what I've brought over to Power DMS that they already had baked into their culture and their business model, but have done my best to steward and, and to grow <clears throat> is, is the notion that if you're able to find meaningful relationships that can help position you for success, you're going to get to where you want to be faster. And so uh, I'm always, uh, maybe even to a fault sometimes, looking for opportunities um, to partner rather than to, to block out um, folks, right? You know, I, I think... Um, I think that the, the classic capitalist model is, is to find your competition and crush them. Um, but I think particularly when you're a mission-driven organization as a nonprofit or a for-profit, that you wanna partner with other people who are trying to do good work in that space and see how you can amplify your work together. And so I, I do a lot of that in my current role. Thank you, Josh. All right, Joshua, our next questions are about your personal and professional development and the first question comes from me. Uh, so the question is this, uh, what is the habit that you think every young professional should work on and build uh, in their careers? Oh, there are so many. I, I've struggled with a lot of stuff, so it's been really hard. I, I, I feel like I'm constantly working on some sort of a chink in the armor. Um, but in terms of a habit that I think every young professional should take on, there's an element of like needing uh, the resources of others to help you advance in your career. And, and, and when you understand that, that you've kind of got um, only so much that you can do to really move yourself along uh, in your own career and how many other people are needed to sort of help you take that next step, then you really start to understand, I need to build a team around myself. Uh, and that, you know, it's, is it a habit? I think so. I think it's a habit because when, you know, I've achieved in the past few years a handful of mile, very meaningful milestones in my career, and it'd be very easy for me to become complacent. Um, when I get to that next phase, 
about beginning to drop that mentality of needing to build my team. And, and the team is, again, I think, I think it's yourself and the skills you have. It's your network that you can rely on for a variety of things, both to help your folks in your network. And the more, the more you move up in your career, the more that that's the, one of the more important parts of networking. And then to, to get some reciprocal value from that, it's finding ment a mentor or mentors to help you think through your, your professional life holistically and then even bleeding into your personal life sometimes. And then I think the other element of that is trying to find if your organization is large enough, uh, a coach. And a coach is a little different than a mentor. A coach is somebody who is somebody who's higher up possibly in your own organization who can help to position you within your own organization for success. Um, you know, I like signing up for projects that I know I'm going to work on that have value above and beyond my job function with people who are at a higher level than I am. And a coach can help position you to take on meaningful roles in those types of environments. So find yourself coaches, mentors, uh, leveraging your network, and then, you know, leveraging your own personal skills as the team that you need to keep moving up in your career and just keep advancing. Even if you want to be an entrepreneur, I still think those things are important. You need to find folks uh, that can be a sounding board and help you move forward because uh, you can't get it done on your own. Okay, I have a follow-up though. Um, again, was this instinctual for you or you learned it the hard way? Definitely learned it the hard way. Um, I, I lucked into having one of the best mentors I could possibly ask for uh, because she was my boss. So like it, it didn't, you know, that's not... Unfortunately, for most people, you don't really have that uh, advantage, right? I, I've had, I've been fortunate to really only have, you know, a handful of bosses in my career, and they've all been great. Uh, but some of them have been better at mentoring than others. And frankly, it's not their job to mentor me, it's their job to uh, facilitate me being the best that I can be in the role they've given me. So, uh, but I had a great mentor and that mentorship has persisted beyond uh, my employment. And so, um, I think that you should approach that intentionally. I think if you approach it intentionally, not only are you going to get the best mentor that you can find, but if you know what your goals are going into that, similarly to like finding someone in an industry you want to work for and asking them very, you know, specific questions, that intentionality is going to get you the most out of the relationship that you can possibly get. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Gerardo. Yeah, Josh, I'd love to know what books you are currently reading and if you recommend any of them. Um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I am uh, reading Malcolm Gladwell's, uh, I, I guess not even be, not be his latest book, uh, David and Goliath, I think it's called. Uh, I've, been, I've been trying to work my way through that one for a long time. I really like Malcolm Gladwell's um, writing style. I've always struggled at reading pretty thick, uh, dense books, but um, his book, his writing style, very storytelling in nature. And so I always like reading that. Um, you know, uh, I, I think in, I think in the interview, I talked a little bit about going through um, emotional intelligence 2.0 and that, uh, that, that style of uh, self-evaluation and, and uh, doing an audit of your emotional intelligence. So I highly recommend that's more of more of a, an exercise than a read, but there's definitely a reading component to it. Um, so those are a couple of books that I would, I would throw out there. Thank you. Kyle has a question about your personal development. Yeah, Josh, back to time management and uh, knowing your limits. How do you find time for work, practicing with your band and then performing <laughs> as well? Um, uh, well, uh, if anybody's interested in like kind of understanding the evolution of that, you could go to my Facebook page, uh, for my band and look at our events calendar from the past. And you can see that the frequency of performances, uh, has certainly dropped off a bit. So, um, you know, uh, I, I would say without getting in too much of the nuances of how I manage my band, um, I, uh, I, I definitely have become more selective over time about um, what I'm looking to bring on uh, in terms of, of uh, performance opportunities. Um, you know, uh, I, I do think, you know, that, that, that question begs a couple of ideas uh, in my mind. One, I, I do think 
everybody who I know who's been really good at their jobs has had something outside of work that they pour a lot of energy and focus into other than like family. And what you didn't mention there is that I, I am married and I have a two-year-old daughter. So, so that takes a ton of time as well. But I also have a great, wonderful wife who's been a great support system. She also does, does a number of things outside of work and in her home life. She's a, a fantastic athlete and she plays on a roller derby team, uh, which she really enjoys. And that's a whole other story. But I, I, I would tell you that um, you got to find something like that to put a lot of energy into that, that creates a separate place for you to go with your mind and your energy and your attention because sometimes your home life is going to is going to be difficult sometimes your work life is going to be difficult and and unfortunately sometimes both of them are going to be difficult simultaneously and if you don't have a place that you can put that energy and and that you can focus on and sort of you know you know get the wires in your brain and those synapses reconnected in a productive way um I, I think that you're missing out on an outlet that would otherwise help you to be successful. Sure. No, I think that's so important. Um, if the smoking jackets need a backup basis, hit me up. All right. I'll, I'll let you know, Kyle. My bass player calls out quite a bit. <laughs> that's great. Very important to be well-rounded. Uh, a great reminder. Josh Snyder, we are closing in on our final question. And that question is this. Um, what message would you like to share with the Crummer community? Huh, wow. Um, you know, I guess the one message I would share with the Crummer community is, is thank you. I, uh, I've had some big milestones in my career um, in the past decade, um, some very recent, um, that have caused me to reflect on, you know, what's gotten me here. And I think if this little liberal arts school hadn't been, you know, plunked down in, in Winter Park, Florida with an incredible MBA program, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today. And um, I hope through my involvement with the school going forward that I'm able to um, help give back a little bit, not only to the school, you know, at large, but also to some other students and younger alumni that are that are coming out of the school. Um, and uh, I think we just have an incredible community here uh, at Crummer, um, both you know nationally and internationally and certainly here uh, in, in the greater Orlando area. Um, and I'm so very thankful for the school support um, and uh, the support of all the alumni and family of Crummer. Well, I think the Crummer community would like to uh, say the same thing about you. And with that, I want to thank you, Joshua Snyder, for joining us here on the Crummer Hour. Thanks, JB. It was my pleasure. It's our pleasure to have you. This is uh, Joshua Snyder, Crummer alumnus and Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development at Power DMS. Thank you again. I would also like to thank our panel of Crummer students and alumni, which includes Gerard Mitchell, MBA 2018, Gerardo Abril, MBA 2020, Kyle Sawyer, EA MBA 37, and Loveland Finley, MBA 60. Thanks for being here, everybody. Thank you, Josh. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thank you guys. so much, Josh. It was Josh. my pleasure. All right. Nice. Good job. Thanks, Josh. That was All great. Right. That was yeah, great. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon with another episode. Today's Crummer Hour has been brought to you by the Crummer Graduate School of Business at Rollins College. Now is a great time to consider enhancing your career success by pursuing an advanced degree in business. And the Crummer School offers a variety of educational programs to help you become a global, responsible, innovative business leader. To learn more about the programs and begin the application process, go to crummer.rollins.edu. The Crummer Graduate School of Business, experience excellence. The Crummer Hour is a production of Victor Media Group. It's the mission of Victor Media Group to make the world a better place by making ourselves better people. If you like this show, follow Victor Media Group on your favorite social media platform or visit our website at victormediagroup.co. Today's show was hosted by J.B. Adams and executive produced by Gerard Mitchell, 
with sound editing by Aaron Trinka and production assistance by Kyle Sawyer. Our gratitude goes out to Greg Golden, Director of Student Media at Rollins College, the entire team at WPRK, and Mike Brown and Loveland Finley in Crummer Alumni Relations for their gracious help and support. This is JB Adams, and until next time, Fiat Luck.